All right, welcome to the second seminar in the uh, CAIL uh, series. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Cloud and Container uh, Apprentice Linux Engineer program that we're doing. This is uh, uh, talk two of the eight that we're gonna be doing this week. Um, we are now gonna be doing a talk uh, on Zen, the way of the panda, getting started with Zen. And uh, your two presenters are uh, Lars uh, Kurt and uh, George Dunlop. So, and uh, with further ado, I'll pass it over to them. Thank you. All right, can you actually, let me just pull this a bit higher. Is that all right? Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, short introduction. So my name's Lars Kurt. I'm the community manager of the Xen project. Uh, I also happen to chair the advisory board and uh, I'm director at Citrix's open source programs office. I love plants, which is why I picked a lovely picture with a queen of the night, um, <laughs> which, as you see, is quite a big flower. Um, and uh, this is George. Um, uh, he's one of the committers on the Xen project and also... I'm actually a principal software engineer. Uh, oh, principal. Sorry. <laughs> I, did, I did send the thing past you and you didn't spot it earlier. Um, and so I love DIY, and that's the... the um, my, the lamp on the ceiling of my living room, anyway. Yeah, he does do a lot of DIY, so uh, yeah, me too, by the way. And, uh, well, session goals. So, we're first gonna start with a few basic uh, virtualization concepts. So, who in the room knows anything about virtualization? A couple of people. So, of those who have, um, uh, what kind of tech, so who, who's used KVM before? A few, all right. Um, uh, um, who's used any other hypervisors before? Yeah. VMware, okay. So we, we kind of got a bit of a mix, so we might have to, you know, because I didn't know which level to pitch this at, at all together, right? So, um, uh, so we started very low, so we may, you know, if it gets too boring, I'm gonna check in and then we can zoom over some stuff and pick a few more interesting uh, topics. Um, so we're gonna go through some of the Xen basics and concepts and use cases with exercises. We're going to interleave that. And then there'll be a section at the end of how you can get help from the community and uh, point us to presentations with a few more interesting topics uh, and advanced features. So uh, normally, um, when you use Xen, you will probably use it as part of a product such as Xen Server or, a, you know, a distro um, or, you know, like a security project product like Cubes OS and so on and so forth. Um, however, what we really wanted to do at the session is basically um, use it directly with the tools which come from Xen, which is a little bit less user friendly than you know than than when you comp use it in a product, but at least you you learn some of the concepts and background idioms if you want so by by doing so. So that's why we kind of set it up that way. So, what's Xen and the Xen project? Well, it's a virtualization platform. It's fairly versatile. It's basically designed to be a component in a software stack. So at the very early days and even to some degree now, um, the, you know, like end users weren't really the primary goal of the project in the same way as end users aren't really the primary goal of the Linux kernel. It's, it's then, you know, then gets picked up by distros and products who polish it and make it, you know, more usable. Um, the way how I often think about it is to think about the hypervisor itself or Xen as the engine which is then taken by um, system integrators to be put you know, into a car uh, or you know, a more polished product. And if examples of that are you know, in server virtualization, Xen Server, Oracle VM, and cloud service providers, you know, like Amazon, for example, have to a custom built um, integration layer around Xen. If you use you know, another, uh, Hosting, if you use hosting providers, that support will come out of a VPS control panel, you know, or sometimes OpenStack and so on and so forth. For security-based product, it'll be Cubes OS, or products such as Crucible Security Suite. And then embedded in automotive, you'll be using, you know, like products like Virtuosity or EPAM Fusion or some of those kind of things. Um, then the project itself does more than just a hypervisor. 
And we have a number of um, uh, sub-projects, some deal with PV drivers, and then another set is related to Unikernels. So we have two projects there, one called Mirage OS, the other one Unicraft. Um, <coughs> so some basic concepts. Um, this is what your normal stack without virtualization looks like. You have your hardware at the bottom, your BIOS, your kernel as part of the OS and applications which run in it, and then you know, also the kernel will have drivers to talk to the hardware in it. So what the hypervisor does at the end of the day, it separates the operating system and applications from the an underlying hardware through virtual machines, and that creates the illusion that a virtual machine owns a set of CPUs and memory within the host, and it does that by temporarily managing CPU resources, so it's, you know, like the CPU time available is it's cut into portions and gets assigned to VMs, in virtual CPUs at the end of the day, and then spatially we do the same with memory, where sets of memory gets assigned to, um, to virtual machines. And then separate from that is I.O. virtualization, where we basically multiplex I.O. devices across different um, domains, and there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, Xen uses a number of them, including pass-through. So hypervisor architectures, very simple. So we have the sort of ESX server model, um, where you just have to host the hypervisor, basically one big piece of software, I'm very simplifying. Um, very much there, which includes all the drivers and so on, and then you have the virtual machines on top of it. Obviously, one, this doesn't cover things like control plane and so on and so forth. Then you have the sort of Xen model where you have a host, the hypervisor self, and it collaborates with a special VM from which we get the drivers and some of the um, uh, services. I think Hyper-V is kind of similar in some sense, and then we have KVM and virtually virtual box, where at the end of the day, we have um, some portion of the software run within the kernel, which provides services to a larger user space component, and they together then um, pr provide the hypervisor. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's basically the intro. Um, uh, have you started to so? Who, who's got the virtual box stuff installed on their machine at this stage? Only one person. So, so who actually wants to really follow us in the um, session and follow the exercises? Are you installing it right now? OK. I'm just checking because we'll probably be at a stage in five, 10 minutes when we need that. <laughs> All right. So, um, so what is Xen in a bit more detail? So. Um, uh, we have the hypervisor directly running on the hardware that primarily does scheduling, memory management, timers, and interrupt. Then um, we have DOM0, which is a pri privileged virtual machine which exposes a number of services um, to the system. These would be things like SendStore, SendBus, which does all the settings, um, the tool stack, which basically deals with the interface to the outside world. Um, and you know device emulation, which in our case is QMU, to emulate you know hardware devices and so forth, and that's kind of a standard setup. There's a few more, and it's also the source of uh, device drivers, which we basically reuse um, from within um, DOM0. Then we have a number of guests. There's just a couple of examples with different modes there. I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail later. The other key part, so we talked about tool stack before, so there's two bits to that. One is the Excel command line interface, and the second one are domain configuration files. So Excel is the built-in tool stack, but you can also use Versh or Word Manager, for example, or you can use Xapi as part of Xen Server, XCPNG. Um, they're more user-friendly in many ways. There's also other tools like Xen Tools, which sit directly on top of Excel which makes things a little bit easier uh, to use and hide some of the complexities um, of Xen from you. But we wanted to learn today how, you know, um, what these are. Um, so Excel basically, you know, it's used to create, pause, shutdown, 
domains and all the sort of command uh, um, you use uh, to control your system. It's normally run as root uh, within DOM0. And then you have your domain configuration files and there's the links to the docs. Those describe um, individual VMs and their configurations and then you would pass these via Excel to, um, uh, to Xen. Um, IO virtualization, another key concept. So how do we do that in Xen? Um, so if we have a HVM guest, um, which is a guest which uses hardware virtualization, basically would have a, an unmodified uh, operating system running here with a, with a native driver that basically talks to um, uh, indirectly to QMU via a, you know, an I.O. block that QMU exposes, which then talks to the native device driver, and that's kind of how you would talk to the outside world. Um, the other mode is what we call PV, and in that case, we would have a, a, a front-end driver and a back-end driver, so the front-end driver would always be um, in the guest OS, and there's basically drivers for pretty much, for most OSs, at least for a network and disk, <clears throat> and then the back-end driver is in DOM0, and that today gets all shipped out of the box within um, within Linux and most BSD versions. And then of course, you know, um, if you install the relevant drivers, you could do that for Windows as well. But there's not gonna, be, there's not, these, we don't have um, PV drivers for every possible um, device. Um, primarily for the ones which are used during boot, bootstrapping and booting, there's, you know, performance isn't such a big deal. Um, so there we just use the ones from QMU. All right, so I kind of covered that already here. Oh yeah, and then there's a few PV backend drivers which run in user space for things like um, QCAR2 images. Um, if you're interested in that, come and talk to us uh, later. Um, how does networking work in principle? All right, so that's the same thing. So we have the uh, network, the front, end driver and a backend driver. And uh, here you have the native driver and basically these are the virtual interfaces, uh, the interfaces which are exposed for those devices with the relevant naming conventions. Now, when you create a guest with Excel, um, uh, fundamentally the networking topology isn't configured um, within um, DOM0. So you have to deal with this yourself um, so this is actually generally, we tend to do that whenever there's functionality within Linux, you know, where you can do stuff, we use the way how Linux does it, but that means you don't necessarily get an entirely smooth user experience. Um, so, you know, like Excel doesn't extract some of the details from you. So then we have install file locations. So once you install Xen, so there's a number of directories um, uh, which are really worth looking at. So etc. Xen is where basically we have example config files in there. You can put your config files in there. There's a number of setup scripts in there. Var log Xen is where all the log files go. Um, Userlib 64 Xen, or you know, in, this, in other distros it might just be lib, um, is where the Xen binaries and firmware and other related binaries go. And then there's some when Xen installs itself, it will put stuff into, into the boot directory too. And that brings us to the first exercise portion. I think if we swap actually, because I think it would unlead both hands, but that's all right. Uh, that's okay. In fact, I prefer telling something when I speak, so. Uh, so if you've got uh, VirtualBox open, um, you can go to File, Import, and then, so in this case, it's, it's under, if you've got the, the thing copied down there as exercise VBA, Zen exercise OVA. So you open that. Um, everything looks good here. You might, I mean, just for good practice, you might want to do this. 
um, although it's all natted and internal, so it probably doesn't matter too much. So import that. Um, and so did, did you go over the, the setup and stuff at all? You can do that later. Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so basically for the demo, what we're going to do is we're going to run... Um, a graphical thing here. I got tricked oh. by my own slide forward. Hmm? Yeah, so basically what we're going to do, so... Um, uh, <laughs> it swapped. Uh, ah, there we go. Yeah. So we're basically going to, we're, we're installing VirtualBox. Within VirtualBox, um, we're going to run this, in, in an initial image, there's a version of CentOS. And then we're going to install Xen on top of it, um, which actually means that Xen after the install will run on a nice Send OS and Send OS will be your DOM zero OS, and then we will just play with um, a few operations on various um, uh, um, guests. Uh, if you have internet connectivity issues, because the, the, the install will put, fetch some packages from uh, Send OS, um, then we have an image prepared where all of this has been done. So it's a little bit like a we prepared this before cooking lesson thing, um, such that we don't need to spend too much time on some of these operations. And why the strange setup? Well, actually, if you wanna, you know, if you run Xen, basically it takes over your entire machine. Um, and obviously, you we don't want- sure everyone would appreciate having your laptops, uh, you know. Yes, that's out, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> People have different environments, right? And, uh, Basically, we can actually show pretty much everything with on running guest with uh, Xen within VirtualBox, um, and then why an old Xen version? Because fundamentally, um, we backported a lot of stuff recently because of Spectre Meltdown to Xen to, to Xen 4.8 in Xen OS 7, and I think that's it. Basically, yeah. Apologies. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'll do it. Um, and it's worth going to file host network manager. Just double check to make sure you have VBox zero and everything is, is set up properly. Um, okay. So we have imported our virtual appliance um, and now we need to open it up. Just double check to make sure that we have uh, the right configuration. So we want to have a uh, reasonable amount of RAM. The processor, we want to have these two processors for the purpose of this uh, exercise. Um, the network, uh, we want to make sure the first adapter is NAT, and the second adapter is VBox NAT0, and that this says promiscuous mode allow all. So the promiscuous mode will allow the, um, the guests to also speak on the, on the network. Um, okay, I think that was it for this bit, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, so now we start our guest. And it opened it up here for some reason. I saw it boot. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's booting. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's terribly hard to read. Yes. Um, okay, uh, so it's um, the password is is uh, so it's root password is Zen root, and oops, oh sorry, uh, right, um, and by by default it's set up with the US key map. If like me, you're using something strange like Colmac, then you need to actually change the, the key map. So let me do that. Yeah. I don't know. Can you maybe, we can do that with the terminal uh, window, presumably, but not with that one. Scale mode? Uh, 
So I, it just, for some reason, it keeps putting it on my main window here instead of, okay, so hopefully this should be a bit better. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so we're, we're going to be using the, we're going to be using the, the, the terminal most of the time, uh, so this hopefully won't be so much of an issue. Um, let me try this. Okay. Can you see my? There it is. Ah. Can you be with this? Um, so now we, if we do, um, just check to see what the IP address is. Okay, so now if we open up a terminal, um, let's see if things work. Hopefully that will work, okay. Um, Five six two. Sorry. One oh four, yeah. Okay. Um, right, so now we can have access to it kind of normally. Um, so uh, if you have the instructions there, they have instructions on how to set the um, the host, so you can just do SSH DOM zero. Um, I'm not going to do that this time, but you can do that if you want, make it a bit easier. Um, so just an introduction to the demo directory here. Is this, is this large enough? We do make this a bit larger for anybody. Make it a little bit larger, see how that works. Um, so the stuff is in the demo, slash demo directory. Um, so master images has our sort of pre-baked images that'll make this thing go a lot faster. Um, scripts has a couple of helpful scripts. Um, the images directory is empty, um, but we'll have, um, that's, what we'll, that's what we'll be using for our kind of working area. And what else do we have? Okay, so installing Zem. So, We generally recommend that you, tr we're generally trying to push people to use, rather than downloading packages from us or building from the scratch themselves, unless they really want to, we try and encourage people to use um, distro packages and we work, try and really work closely with um, uh, the distro people to make that happen. So um, for CentOS, you first install, oops, what did I do here? I want dash Y, not dash I. And that is because I don't, is this connected to the network? Sorry. Uh, is, is, I'm connected to your Wi-Fi. Is that connect, also connected to the network? Oh, you have to change the. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, you have to make sure to be connected to the, let me see, I'll have events here. Hopefully this will work. I've never tried switching the network in the middle of the thing. Um, let's try this again. All right, okay. And what this does is it enables the Zen repositories for CentOS. Uh, that still doesn't work. Slow. Uh -oh. That seems to work. Okay. Okay, here we go. That's better. Okay, so now we want to update our kernel. So the um, Zen needs a DOM zero kernel, which is capable of doing uh, working with Zen, and the default one that comes with CentOS seven uh, does not have that configuration. So the the, uh, the Zen CentOS uh, thing provides a kernel. So we need to 
install the a DOM zero capable kernel. And we generally just pick a recent stable version and stick with that until it expires and then move to a new stable version. Uh, so here we're on 4.9 at the moment. I wonder since when that then can run inside the virtual box because I was I was working on Zen maybe mm -hmm. two or three years ago, but before that Zen is able to run inside the virtual box. So um, so modern processors have uh, a, a, um, is twenty years ago it was very very difficult to virtualize x86, right? There was a whole bunch of instructions that. So they couldn't be virtualized, and VMware made a huge amount of money by being the only game in town that actually had the complicated stuff to actually be able to run it. And it didn't, it had to use a technique called binary translation, where it would read the binary um, from the kernel and dynamically convert it into a different kind of code, like j basically just in time compiling, right? Um, Zen, so since that time, and the technology that KVM uses, um, and that VirtualBox uses, um, there's now hardware support for virtualization, right? Now, Zen, so there's the ancient past and there's when hardware support came, okay, so this is, time is going that way. Zen actually, Zen was actually invented about three or four years before hardware support was available. So Zen has, has this is why, I mean, it's a little bit complicated with Zen if you start to use it because there's this HVM and PVH mode and there's PV mode. PV mode was the mode that was Zen was designed for that didn't have, doesn't require any of the hardware support for virtualization. Does that make sense? So one of the interesting kind of um, features of Zen is that, so Zen has two, on, on, on hardware, you have two kinds of guests. You have HVM guests, um, which typically, which emulate a full machine. So you can install Windows on there. Anything you can install on a PC, you should be able to install on an HVM guest, okay? Um, it also has PV mode, which is this classic, this older mode, which doesn't require any of the hardware support. Um, now that requires you to have a modified kernel, um, but Linux has those modifications and so does um, NetBSD, for instance, and there's a bunch of other ones that have that too. Um, so um, if you're only gonna do PV, um, you can actually run Zen inside of any virtual machine. Right, so you can run Zen, so um, we'll show you a bit later, uh, like if we do look at the D message, it'll tell you that there's no HVM support so we can't run HVM guests. But we can run PV guests. And this is actually true on any cloud instance. You, if you p open up um, a normal kind of a cloud instance on um, an HVM capable cloud instance on Amazon or something like that, you can install Zen inside there and run PV guests inside of, inside of Zen on, on the cloud without requiring any extra support. Does that answer your question? So, so yes, Zen, Zen should have been able to run in, I mean, unless there was a bug, Zen in PV mode should have been able to run in VirtualBox since the time it began. Um, Zen HVM, unless VirtualBox has added nested virtualization support, um, then you won't be able to run it. Um, and ne ne nested, nested, sorry, nested HVM, nested hardware support is actually quite complicated. Um, it's available on most hypervisors, Zen has it, KVM has it, but most people disable it by default because it's, it's like just another level of complexity that most people don't want to deal with. Does that make sense? Um, okay, and that's installed in the meantime. And now we're gonna actually install Zen itself. And unfortunately that's gonna take a few. Oh, that's pretty fast actually. Yeah, and for example, that whole nested thing, you know, we, if you do OpenStack testing, for example, you know, we're basically just um, running the entire OpenStack Tempest suite, test suite as, you know, PV mode within, um, within a cloud, um, uh, you know, like Rackspace and so on and so forth. Because that's kind of how they are, you know, the test infrastructure is set up. Um, so that's presumably also why, you know, since we've been doing that, yeah. some, of the, some of the underlying issues, you know, probably would have been found and, um, uh, and bugs raised, and that's why it really works nowadays. Really very well if you have tried before and it hadn't worked. Yep. 
That is a little bit slower than when I did that at home. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so the last thing, as Lars said, we need to set up a, a Linux bridge. <coughs> and every distro and every version of the distro has a slightly different way of doing this. Um, so normally you would have to look up in your distro how to set up a Linux bridge. Um, in this case, um, I just wrote a script to do it for you. Okay, and double check to make sure that worked. Um, yes, we have two Ethernet devices and two bridges. Um, and now, if we reboot, I think you have to give the virtual box Renovo focus again and then it'll show what it does. Right. And we have Zen Hypervisor as an option and it says loading Linux. Da, 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 da. And how far did how far are we going before we switch back? I think is, uh, is, is that the end of this section? I yeah, that's the next one's another section. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, so why is it black now? Um, yeah, now we're going to revisit some of those things we've seen a little bit more detail, and then we're going to have the next exercise. So uh, so I wanted to look at networking again, so we basically um, there's a number of different tactics you can use to set up. Uh, oh, no, 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 hang on, I went back. Oh, didn't I? Ah. So this is what I showed before. So we, George and script just set up um, uh, a bridging, but you can also use other uh, techniques, uh, topologies, like, at open, like open B switch, routing on that. Um, there's a couple of examples of how you do that for different distros in our wiki and uh, also some matching and configuration examples. Um, so once you have that set up, once you have bridging set up, in our case we had two bridges um, because of the way how we set up VirtualBox. Basically after the script has run we have that set up and then in a configuration file um, basically you connect each DOM zero, DOM U um, virtual interface um, um, to, to the relevant bridge via a, an entry in the um, uh, configuration file, which looks like that, with a MAC address and then which bridge to connect to. The default is uh, bridge zero, and then there's matching examples for you know for different network topologies. Um, we do normally pick out um, uh, the, we normally hard code the MAC addresses because if you don't, Excel will just use one for you and then you, you know, you have little control over. I mean, it, it'll assign one randomly every time it boots and if you, um, and that means that you get a completely new MAC address, which usually means you get a new IP address too, which is not often what you want. So if you statically assign the MAC addresses um, is, is best practice. Yeah. Um, so that's basically how how you set up the networking stuff. I wanted to talk a little bit about guest types. Um, so George already mentioned this. So originally we started off with PV support in 2003. Um, it requires um, PV support in guest operating systems. And from 2011, it's basically been in Linux. So it's pretty much in all uh, Linux distros, unless it's been actively in disabled you know, by a distro vendor. Um, then in 2005, 2006, that's when hardware extension came for virtualization. Um, we added that to Xen around the time. Over the following years, um, a number of optimizations to that were really made. Um, so, for example, you know, as hardware acceleration became available, you know, Xen just started to detect, for example, whether local APIC or posted interrupts or something like that is there and started using it. Um, in a similar way, if the um, host and guests have software extensions, um, uh, then we were starting to use those as well. So, you know, an example might be, um, you know, like if you run Windows guests and the Viridian 
extensions, which are basically, which is basically Hyper-V support um, is available, then we will use that and it will make Xen faster, um, HVM guests faster on that specific, uh, in that specific environment. And it was labeled PVHVM, if you, you know, if you hear that, that's basically just HVM as an accelerator. Um, around 2013, we added Xenon ARM support. What's interesting about that is that we don't have that PV HVM split. We just started with one guest, and that also led us to rethink how we do PV. Um, so basically, that's a new thing we've been working on for a while, which is basically, it's called PVH. It's fundamentally an HVM guest, which is supposed to bring the best of PV and HVM together. So in a bit more detail, I'm just going to skip over that because we lost a little bit of time. Um, actually, I'm just going to skip these entirely. And you can look them up on the site. So basically, you choose those guest types via the type um, option. So you know, as we said, PV modes primarily used for legacy hardware and legacy guest images, if you already have those images running somewhere. Um, and in special in scenarios, um, for, you know, um, like uh, unikernel sometimes, you know, it, demos like these um, uh, might be useful for container hosts and in some other um, uh, situations. Um, normally you would use HVM. It's the best performing option for Linux and for, for, for basically most environments. And it really is also the environment which really looks closest to your you know, PC um, uh, when you work with it. So PV will look a little bit different and we'll get, you'll get exposed to some of that. And then we have PVH, which is relatively new. And you can look at that. Um, uh, um, there's a link at the end um, where you get a more specific presentation about PV and PVH and how we, where we're moving with regards to Xenon x86. Um, <clears throat> so, the other key thing is disk. So you know every um, every guest needs a disk and um, uh, or several. And the disk entry in the um, configuration file basically allows you to describe that. So the first thing is you have a format. You describe the virtual device name. Then you can decide whether it's read or write. If it's if it contains an ISO um, to to install that in your guest, then uh, you have to uh, uh, select dev type CD-ROM, and then the target is basically the, the path uh, at which the, um, uh, the image is. Um, we'll see a couple of examples of that later. There's two places, well, um, you can either have the, um, uh, um, the images, you can carve up your, your, your host's um, uh, uh, physical disk into multiple uh, devices via um, LVM or, you know, you just use the guest disk image and, 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 and put the uh, um, guest images into files. That's what we're doing for the demo. Or you can do use remote storage and there's a whole range of options available, which is what you would normally do um, in a real production environment. Um, how do you connect to a VM? So we've got DOM0 and a few guests there. So one of the things um, which, when you, particularly when you create um, a new guest, you will use the, te the text console, either via Excel console or with an option when you, do ec or when you create a guest, and it will redirect the output from the guest to your DOM0. Um, or um, you could just SSH in, so we've just seen that. Um, George did that earlier. Um, or you could use VNC. Um, if you have the appropriate support installed um, or enabled in uh, in Adam Zero, um, but it's slightly different as to what you need to do in um, HVM and PVH PV guests. Then we have the basic uh, command line options. So um, Excel create to create a guest, um, shut down to shut it down. There's destroy, which is needed if the guest. What shutdown does it really? It just sends a signal to the guest to tell it. Please shut down and you know and go away. If that doesn't happen, you can destroy it. There's also capability to pause and unpause a guest, which just freezes it. There's a number of information options or info gives you general system information, list lists what guests are running, 
top is like uh, Excel top is like the top command for processor on Linux, and then there's a little command called uptime, which I think just gives you general overview stat around how long a guest has been running. For debug, we have Excel D message, which gets you it's the DOM zero log or the hypervisor log, is it? The hypervisor log, and then you can have a number of other logs from various specific um, locations. And it's very useful when something goes wrong. Apologies, I'm starting to lose my voice right now. Um, but I'm handing over to George now to um, show you some of this in a bit more detail. If that'll work, then we should be able to SSH in. And uh, yes, if if um, if it didn't work, you'll get a you'll get an obscure error message from Excel when it does that. So um, so we can. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these. You've covered the well. So a um, couple just places to look for stuff. Um, at CZen has, uh, so xl.conf is a global config file for the Excel tool stack. Um, the Excel example files are just some example files you can use for how to set up a PV or, or um, HVM guest. Um, and there's a couple other things in there that you can sort of look up. Um, uh, so. Um, so you can see the um, the installation has already set, set up a whole slew of kind of services that, that are getting run. Um, Excel info just kind of gives you, let me see if I can find the interesting information about the, the host. Um, see what, so one of, one of the key things here is the Zen major and Zen minor uh, and extra stuff like that. That's, which you're going to need if you're um, going to send uh, stuff if you send it in a bug report, um, and you can do Excel D message to see the Zen um, command line, and I think we see. Da, 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 da. I was going to look for the HPM. Oh, this is a mail. So. Anyway, um, right. So, and Excel list will show you um, what domains are running. Sorry, so a domain is a running instance of a virtual machine, and domain zero is the, uh, as we said, the the control uh, domain that has control over everything. Um, so, uh, we're going to CD to demo images, and then we're going to copy. Sorry. Uh, we're gonna. So this is a pre-baked, um, just normal CentOS 7 guest minimal image with a QCow thing. So we're gonna copy that here, and it'll take a, a minute or two. Right, and then we're gonna do the same thing. Uh, sorry, actually, what I wanted to do was. I want to name this to C701 because we're going to have more than one. Okay, so if we edit this, then um, this is a lot of, all these comments can of course be taken out. This just kind of to make things a bit easier to, to run. Um, so, the, one of the key things we're going to do, as we said, is to change. Lars has helpfully made this so it won't work now unless we replace unless we add new MAC addresses. Um, so we need to add in MAC addresses and we, um, different MAC addresses for each um, uh, virtual network card, and we need to change the location of the file. So let's do this one first, and this is. Uh, 
incom oh, that's right, an incomprehensible error. So yeah, so there's also, helpfully, Lars has made a typo in the, 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 the file. So there shouldn't be a, it should say qcow2 in the format, but not have a dash there. Um, so in order to make it easy to have a uh, unique um, MAC address for each VM, I made a script. So you type the, and that. So actually what I'm gonna do is just do, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Get rid of this now. Hello. Nope. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to do. Okay. Move this up a bit. So we're gonna copy and paste this. Right, Lars? I think yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So now, if we do moment of truth, does it work? Yeah. So this is the virtual. Um, we won't go into this too much, but this is essentially a virtual grub for the guest, and we're just going to boot the normal. Thing. And in a second, yeah. Right, so this is the console for the, the, the next level guest which is running inside of this. Um, and we're going through the same trick with um, finding out what the, uh, so, um, is 105. Okay, so to disconnect from the console, it's a bit like Telnet. So you press control, um, close bracket, and then I'm gonna open up another. And make this bigger a bit. It's 105, was it? Yeah. And we want root. Okay, um, and so that's that. So now if we, um, just to have something interesting to show, Lars has uh, added to the demo thing um, this Mersenne Prime uh, Python thing. So we're gonna SCP. Um, so this again is DOM zero. So we do Excel list. Then we'll see. Oh, I forgot to I forgot to change the name for this one um, in the config file. So now if we uh, if we run this and then top, then it's similar to top. You can see the two domains that are running, and this one is running. You know, they're both kind of running a few percentages. And if we start to run our Mersenne and Prime thing, let's see. Then this is looking for some kind of prime, and you can see that this is going up to uh, 100%. Um, right. Was that the so we're going to move on? Yeah, I think we can okay. move so on. Let me just stop this. Okay. Yeah, I think the script was kind of showing two VMs as well, but I think that's all right. It's the next one. Oh, it's the next one. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, what's happening, okay. 
All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about virtual CPUs and memory, um, uh, um, because that kind of explains um, how, how scheduling uh, really works in Xen. So basically, um, the main unit um, of, that Xen uses for scheduling is a virtual CPU, not a guest. So you know, in this case, in this picture, we have four physical CPUs, and then you know, basically, um, we assign two virtual CPUs, what a C VCPU command to DOM0, and then what DOM0 sees is basically what it thinks are two physical CPUs, but they're actually really physical, uh, virtual, sorry. Um, then we create a DOM U, which has one virtual CPU, you know, same thing, it just sees one, and then we create, say, another one, which has um, five virtual CPUs, and then we have five virtual CPUs. Um, which um, uh, which are assigned to that specific vir virtual machine. The scheduler then just takes these units and schedules these according to various different criteria. Um, so we have a number of different schedulers. Um, um, what was I going to say? So, so, so basically credit and credit to user, uh, what, what's the term again? Um, what, it's, it's fair and uh, I, forgot, I forgot about it. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so um, um, what people often think, however, is that you know scheduling is done via virtual machine, but it's actually the, the main unit of scheduling is virtual CPUs, which is a little bit confusing sometimes, but. Um, then you have uh, the capability of what we call pinning. So you can basically specify which of the vir real CPUs, um, uh, virtual CPUs can run on. Um, so you can constrain the system in that way and do a bit of optimization. And there's also the idea of soft affinity, where you basically tell the scheduler preference um, for scheduling, um, which is slightly less um, hard. Well, well, which is slightly less. Um, so, so in some situations, the scheduler will basically schedule a VM on a, on a different CPU, but it rarely happens. Um, and there's a number of related Excel commands. There's vCPU list, um, where you can list the, 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 the pinning uh, relationship, and then there's the vCPU pin command, um, where, you, uh, where, where you can pin, which we'll see in a moment. Um, there's also the concept of CPU pools, which is basically just a construct to um, group um, virtual CPUs and CPUs to make that whole command line interface a little bit easier. Um, <coughs> memory, so when Xen starts, um, there'll be a certain amount of memory um, allocated to the system. So, <coughs> so basically different VMs will have will be consuming a different amounts of memory. And then um, uh, there's an amount of unallocated memory, which is, actually, which, which is basically, um, if you think about it, so each, each virtual machine has a thing called a balloon driver in it. Um, so if memory is unused, the balloon driver cobbles up that memory, and then you can deflate it and inflate it. So. For, <coughs> By default, if ballooning is enabled, then all the unallocated memory really resides in a balloon driver in DOM0. And then if you need to grow the memory of another virtual machine, then the DOM0 balloon shrinks and a balloon in another VM just expands. And that's basically how memory is managed. Um, <coughs> there's a number of uh, commands. Um, and config file options, which allow you to control that, so maxim maximum specifies the maximum memory amount a VM can grow to, and in the memory command and memset Excel command line, you use to uh, specifically control that. Um, and that's kind of basically the basic concepts behind that, and then we're gonna go back to the demo portion. And I have to apologize, I'm starting to flag badly because of time zones. <laughs> Um, 
going to shut down all the guests and wait for that. Wait for that to be gone. Um, I'm just going to quickly change this one, the name of this guy, to a one. Okay, so now we're going to actually make a sec. We're going to make a second guest here. name. And I think just to make things easier, I'm just going to like do something like this. Oops. Right. Um, also need to change the disk that it's using, so they're not using the same disk. And I think, oh, and the, um, the demo wants us to make this two vCPUs instead of just one. Did you want to do that for both or just the one? Just the one, right? Just one, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so now if we So the the pause that's happening now is it's um it's waiting for the the grub uh, Grub has a timeout so that you can do something with it. Um, and it's even if you're not connected to the console, it still is waiting. That's why it's taking so long to boot. Um, and now if we do Excel list, we see that we have two guests running. Um, now we're going to where are we at here? Um, make a bunch of extra of extra windows here. And right. And on the left side we're gonna SSH into the first one, so this should be already logged in, so I'm going to make a guess this is going to be 106. That seems to work. Um, okay, and we also, this is also wanted to um, copy the Mersenne Prime thing. Not Oh, yeah, because I, I copied the whole thing, didn't I? OK. OK. Um, so if we run the Merson Prime program in all the windows, uh, Um, and then do, so this is our DOM zero. Um, then we'll see that uh, CPU, that copy two is actually getting, so, so there's, we have two CPUs assigned to our virtual box guest. So we have 200% total CPU to allocate to all of the guests. 
including the domain zero and the two um, CentOS 7 guests. Um, but CentOS 7 2 has two virtual CPUs. And so it is getting two thirds about of the total um, CPU power. And the other one, the first guest, is only getting one third of the total CPU power, um, if that makes sense. Are there any questions about this? No? OK. Um, and now, if we, we need to use something called pinning, so Excel vCPU list. Now, what we're going to do, um, so this has told us, so domain zero has two virtual CPUs. Um, CentOS 7.1 only has one virtual CPU, and CentOS 7.2 has two virtual CPUs. So what we're going to do is we're going to pin. We're going to say this virtual CPU can only run on CPU, on CPU 0, and these two are going to share CPU 1. Does that make sense? So we're going to do XLV CPU pin. So um, domain set to 7.0, virtual CPU 0. We're going to pin it to physical CPU 0. Um, two, we're going to take virtual CPU 0, pin it to physical CPU 1. And we're also going to pin virtual CPU 1 to physical CPU 1. Now if we do, we should see, each of them is getting one full CPU. Does it make sense? So basically, um, we have four copies of the Merce and Prime thing running, two on one and two on the other. Each one is getting half of. Um, for number one, each one's getting half of the virtual CPU. Um, but now, both CPUs for this one is sharing one physical CPU. And this one gets the CPU almost all to itself. Um, yeah, I'm sure that made sense. Um, and then if we do XLV vCPU list, then we can see that both of these vCPUs are running on this physical CPU, and all of these are showing CPU zero. Okay. Um, any questions about that for now? Yeah. What are some scenarios where uh, it becomes a necessary like um, Well. So I, 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 I'm heavily involved in running the scheduler, and pinning kind of messes up the scheduler. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it difficult for it to know how to, how to, how to run stuff. So um, one thing recently, actually, is that um, I don't know if you guys heard of, there's a, one of the exports that came out recently, the, the new kind of um, Spectre ones. Um, it, it's, I, I, it's difficult to, to, to get into, but basically, if you have, so PV, get PV vCPUs can safely share two different threads on the same core, okay? Because a, a PV vCPU can't spy on anything else, okay? But an HVM vCPU can spy on something on the same core, on the same hyper thread. So one thing you might want to do for this kind of thing is to say, well, it basically to pin things such that um, such, such that you never have a situation where an HVM guest can spy on another, an HV VCPU can spawn another VCPU. Does that make sense? So if you know the, if you know the layout and you can, um, I think there's instructions probably in the, in the XSA if you, were, if you were to look at that about how to pin stuff like that. Um, and so just, just to, to make sure it's, I mean, to, to, this is a problem with the hardware. Um, and because KVM essentially is HVM mode, um, KVM has the same problem. Um, so you, I mean, you might, for instance, do the same kind of thing in, if you're running a, a KVM host. But um, so that's one situation. Another situation is just, um, sometimes people want to do stuff with um, allocation. Um, Laura's mentioned a thing called CPU pools, and the purpose of CPU pools was to be able to to, to carve up bits of of space that had their own scheduler, such that you could say to say that you had a, a customer that you wanted to say, I'm going to give you two CPUs or four CPUs, and you can run as many guests on there as you want, but they're just competing with each other. And CPU CPU pools allows you to um, Basically, that, those four CPUs would have entirely their own scheduler. Um, 
But like in a different way you could try to implement that would be pinning. Uh, but if you, if you did that, then the weighting system wouldn't work quite right because it would, anyway, I, I won't get into it. <laughs> but, um, does, does that, does it, I mean, so it's, pinning is, is, is kind of a tool, it's, it's a, kind of a, a, blunt, a blunt tool. Um, there's a lot of things you might want, be want, want to do with it. You might want to say, okay, well, DOM0 is running over here and it, it's being interfered with, you know, so I, I want to um, isolate the performance of something, right? You might want to say, I know that these two things are communicating and sharing a lot of cache. I'm going to pin these two CPUs together. Right, so there's a lot of just kind of things like that you might want to do um, that we don't have higher level primitives to, to, to deal with and then you just like, you just dig into stuff and pin it. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but um, part of the purpose of this was just to help um, explain the concept of virtual machine, virtual CPUs being, being running on different physical CPUs. Does that make sense? Okay, anything else? Um, this, it seems we're going on to memory, or do you want to? Yeah, let's okay. go on to memory. Okay, so the, let's move on to the memory. Um, so we've said, let's go back to DOM0 here. Um, Excel list, so we've got, domain zero has um, one gigabyte assigned to it, so this is in megabytes. Um, and these guys have half a gig each. Um, but they were given, um, Uh, max mem was set to one gigabyte. So we can actually increase that. So we can say XL mem set. So sorry, if we go into the guest, we can say free and it says, well, look, I have half a gigabyte um, total. And uh, we could do that. And then we do Excel list, now we see we've given that one gigabyte, and it's the right one. And now we have a much more free. Um, okay, and I think that was it. Yeah, I think that was it. Okay. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about save, restore, and migrate. Um, uh, um, save and restore are basic building blocks that allow moving VMs from one host to another without downtime. Um, and that's obviously interesting for maintenance, maintenance, replacing hosts, and as building blocks for high availability and disaster recovery. So what we've seen in a demo before, and you know, um, Basically, if you shut down a guest, then all the state is going to be saved into its disks. And then obviously that means when you restart that, um, you could just move them onto a different host and you could do a very basic, um, uh, um, well, I don't know what the technical term for that is, but basic, you know, um, uh, restore in some sense. Um, <clears throat> save and restore is slightly different. So basically, you know, when we have um, a guest running, um, which is described by a specific configuration file, then with Xen, um, that guest CPU and memory state is fundamentally um, uh, um, kept as it runs. Um, when you then perform the Excel save command, uh, basically that state and the configuration file gets saved into a checkpoint file. And, you know, typically then the guest is destroyed and killed and you want to move it somewhere else, right? Um, so the opposite process is when you do a restore, you're basically taking a state which you have saved in that file um, <clears throat> um, back into, you know, via the Excel restore command, back into Xen's um, uh, um, system um, of, of VMs and so on, and basically that recreates, recreates the VM at exactly the same state in point where you left it off when you did the save. And we're going to show that very quickly in a demo now. Um, we didn't make the uh, image large enough to have two guests and the safe state, I think, right? So this is, this is why you have to do the move. Um, I can't remember whether I did that because of the next 
exercise or, <laughs> or right. not. So you, you may as well try and see what happens. OK. Um, right, so we have our, uh, so that's, that's two. No, yeah, these are these two. OK, so we have our thing running. Um, I think actually what I'm going to do Okay, so I'm going to SSH into domain zero, and then I connect to the console of um, number two. Okay, and then we're going to run our Merson Prime program. Okay, um, so it's running here, and then in, in DOM zero. We're going to save the guests. So, Excel save C701. So, you give it the name of the domain you want to save and the file you want to save it to. So, we're going to make a checkpoint. Um, Before you do that, you may want to restart the Mercy and Prime thing because it's probably going to run, run for a out while. of something interest, out of interesting yeah. output. So we're just going to start this again so we have something interesting. And then we're going to save this. So this is pausing it, and it's saving the, the memory state. Oops. Uh, right. So yeah. Um, as predicted, we don't actually have enough um, memory to save the whole thing. Although actually, um, how much have we got here? Yeah, not very much. OK. So let's. Um, Um, let's also um, reduce the size of the thing down to XML set um, back to 512. That'll make it a little bit easier. Of course. Um, okay, let's try this, the save again. Okay, so that is saved. And you see the, the console disconnected. And there's no domains running. Um, da, da, da. Now, if we do XL restore from the checkpoint file, and that's done, and it's picking up where it left off. Um, Is that the main thing you want from this? OK. And I'm just going to stop this. Uh, oops. <clears throat> All right, so we basically went through the building blocks. So migrate kind of puts those together uh, and in the back end coordinates the migration from one host to another. But obviously, we can't easily show that. <laughs> within VirtualBox. Um, but for that to really work, um, at least in upstream, upstream Xen, you have to have shared network stories, uh, storage between the two hosts. Um, this technology is built on top of Xen where you don't need that. Uh, obviously, you need identical host network setups, um, SSH keys and users, and so on and so forth. Um, you need to have compatible host models. So when you make, migrate from one host to another, um, the one you migrate to has to be a superset of the has to have a superset of the capabilities um, which the other host has. Otherwise, when a when a guest wakes up again, um, uh, um, it might just crash, or some other stuff might just go um, and not work properly. And uh, also, you can. Um, migrate a guest from an older version of Xen to a host with a newer version. Um, that's a typical way to do upgrades, actually. Um, and I think, we're, how many versions do we support back? I think it's two or three. I can't quite. Um, the open source version, officially, we only support um, one. 
a while. It might work for more, but we, we, we don't promise anything. Um, most downstreams, like Zenser, for instance, promises a lot more. Um, yeah. OK, so, so officially we only support one, but in practice, you know, because a lot of the downstreams do more, it uh, more tend to work. Um, how we're dealing with time, OK. All right, so I'm, all right, so I guess at this, so I was going to talk a little bit about bootloaders, and uh, we're going we're to show um, uh, how to create a guest from scratch. Um, it's a little bit of a boring topic to some degree, but um, <laughs> no. Yeah, so um, in the interest of time, so do you guys have any questions at this stage? And then we can decide how we deal with the rest of the session. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, I'm not sure, so how fast, well, th th there's a couple different things you might mean. So there's, um, once you tell a guest, get more memory or give us back memory, how much, how fast does that respond? And, but, but I'm not sure if that fits, that interpretation fits with what you were asking. So in my scenario, I would say, um, numbers, Okay. Right. I see. I see. Um, so the, uh, what we were talking about, the kind of um, upstream Zen, is uh, more mechanisms than, than policy. Does, does that make sense? Um, so there are. So, so what you're talking about is allowing a guest to automatically, based on memory pressure, ask for more memory. Um, and at the moment, um, the, the upstream project doesn't have anything kind of like that. So downstream projects, um, I think, so Oracle VM, for instance, has, or Oracle VM uses Zen. Um, they have something called TMEM, which has this whole thing which, where the, the guest can ask for more, more, more memory and, and do a bunch of this kind of stuff. Um, I'm not super familiar with that. Uh, you'd have to look at their, uh, their mechanisms. Um, Zen Server also has some functionality, functionality like that, but I don't think it's, I don't think Zen Server stuff responds to guest memory pressure. Um, it more responds to sort of, um, okay, I've got a host that's got four gigs of RAM and I've got four VMs. So each of them have one, one gigabyte. And then I want to start another VM, right? So then I have to just sort of go and take, you know, a bit from each of them have them all sort of balloon down to a little bit smaller, and then I can boot up another one. And then once that one shuts down, say, well, I can give it back to everybody else. Um, so Zen, Zen Server has that kind of functionality. Um, but it's more at the, it's not responding to guest pressure. It's um, responding to sort of host, host needs. Um, does, does that make sense? Um, so TMEM sounds similar to what you're talking about. Um, uh, but I'm not personally very familiar with it. I mean, it's. I, I, and I know it's in use by, by Oracle VM, but... I mean, it is an upstream, but it's not enabled by default, right? As far um, as I recall. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Anything else you want to see, see in demo before we start? Building our own guest? <laughs> um, yeah. So I, Actually, the whole building your own guest thing is, you know, I mean, it's basically like creating an empty guest <laughs> and, and uh, with a couple of, um, uh, from a couple of Debian um, images and then you mm -hmm. want to install it, so it's actually a little bit boring. <laughs> um, uh, oh, well, I um, mean. Pardon? Yeah. Um, but what I'm going to do is um, briefly walk you through a number of ways. Uh, but I'm going to have to speed up because we don't have that much. How, how, how we do boot in Xen. So this is your typical normal boot process. You have the firmware, bootloader comes in. Basically then, you know, like you plug in your ISO, it puts something into your file system, usually during the install. And then when that's there, you know, basically you boot your um, kernel with the RAM disk. And then you have the normal uh, boot process. It's kind of similar for other 
uh, operating systems, not just Linux. So when you use Xen with an HVM book, uh, uh, guest, basically what happens is initially um, uh, Xen will map the or copy the HVM loader um, into the memory. So that starts, that then will load the firmware, and then you have exactly the same process um, happening again. Um, so basically when you have an HVM guest, it looks exactly as if you, you know, were installing your software on a regular piece of hardware. Um, <clears throat> then there's a thing called direct kernel boot. Um, uh, so actually, if you have a distro where you can get the VM, lin uh, VM Linux and the inert on the, 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 the RAM disk files from the distro specifically, and there's quite a few which do that. So when you go to uh, Debian, for example, or Alpine, and a lot of distros, you can get those files directly. <coughs> Um, and they're usually also useful for netboot and stuff like that, then um, uh, um, you basically just provide the pass name wherever you copied that stuff onto your um, uh, local DOM0 file system into the configuration file. And that's how we were going to show um, the, um, the Debian bootstrap. So basically download those files. We configure um, uh, uh, the um, um, config file to the boot, um, then we, you know, run the actual net installer in it, and then we change the file to afterwards, the configuration file afterwards, to use um, PyGrub, not PVGrub. Um, <coughs> so for PVGuess, there's a thing called PVGrub. So this doesn't come uh, with Xen by default, so you basically will have to get, um, well, Grub2. Um, which contains pvgrub uh, out of the box, build that and install it in your uh, Xen binary directory. And then you can have a library fundamentally of um, kernel images and RAM images, um, which you can then let the user choose from. Um, so basically, in this case, the uh, host administrator fundamentally has control as to what a user can install. And it's fairly attractive to um, uh, Ah, yeah. What, the, what, 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 yeah. What the guest admin can install. Sorry. <clears throat> and what we're going to show in the demo is um, I'm getting confused about this. Is and then we go through all the normal steps again as before. Um, and PyGrab basically um, is a little Perl script that gets run. Um, it's, it comes with Xen. It gets run. Um, <coughs> When a bootloader is set to PyGrub, it exposes exactly the same interface as Grub, and it will basically then boot from your um, DOMU file system. And that's basically what we're going to do in the second step of the uh, demo. So as you will be using HVM guests in, more, in most real life scenarios, um, their workflow is exactly the same as it would be on, on, on real hardware. Um, but that doesn't really scale across a very large number of hosts. So in Xen-based products, um, the install complexity is usually hidden by templates, pre-baked guest images, and so on and so forth. Um, just a quick summary, what's normally in a config file. So we basically have um, the guest name and type. So we've done that before. Then there's a number of options around Booting, so like if you use netboot or direct kernel boot, you will have something like kernel and RAM disk. There's an extra option to basically install a, to run the installer possibly straight away. Um, if you use pvgrub, you would choose one of the um, pvgrub related options, and if you use pygrub, you just use that. And HVM, there's no specific default option at all, but there's some way you can manipulate the, the overall behavior. You have a number of disk specifications for all the disks you have and a network specifications for the networks. And as we've got, we've got five minutes left, right? So um, uh, um, I was just gonna show the key steps here of um, how we, you know, how you then install um, Xen from a virgin um, net image. So you basically get, first step is you, you get those two files, for example, from Debian. The download URL is in the, in the script I gave you. You then create a DOM0 file system. We've done that before. You then set up a config file, which does direct 
direct kernel boot, start the guest. <clears throat> then basically in, in Debian, um, as soon as you do that, the uh, install script um, runs automatically. Um, so you basically just follow all the default prompts. There's a few loose ends that you need to be deal with. For example, it doesn't set up a second network. Um, you have to do that manually. Um, and it also, well, I said we, have to, we had two bridges, right, which we had to set up because of the um, uh, virtual box setup. And then there's some stuff you need to do about uh, SSH logins and so on. And then you just change the config file to use PyGrab. And then from that point onwards, you will basically just boot from the DOMU file system. And that's sort of your typical setup um, to get started in this environment. Then getting help from the community. Um, there's a number of channels. We have an IRC channel on Freenode. There's the Xen, there's a Xen users list. And there's a fairly extensive set of FAQs. Um, whenever you run through issues, um, it's really good to send us all the log files and the de um, uh, de message output. Um, it's what? Oh, yeah, sorry. Barlog Xen, sorry. Um, and there's a number of uh, yeah uh, articles about what information to include and so on and so forth. Um, there's a number of interesting things you may want to look at um, if you're interested. So live patching, uh, virtual machine introspection, and how we manage vulnerabilities um, in those. That, that kind of gives you a high-level overview with some demos. There's some videos in the presentation. There's another interesting talk about virtual machine introspection, which is a, a, a new security technology which allows you to identify um, 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 attacks within your you know, VM without having um, agents installed in your VM to do so. Um, again, if you're interested in that, interesting presentation and, um, uh, and YouTube presentation. There's a presentation by George um, about um, where we're going with Xenon x86. Um, quite interesting. Um, another one about Spectre meltdown and those kind of attacks. We've also seen a lot of um, interest around embedded and automotive. Um, uh, so if you're interested in that, and that's also where things like pinning pinning and those kind of things with those guys, the embedded guys really care about, and different schedulers. And um, again, a few more talks. And then we have Unikernels um, and Unicraft, which is a tool to make new Unikernels. Um, there's been a lot of talk and excitement around that too. And again, if you're interested, a couple more presentations. And we have two more minutes, which I'm going to open to you for questions. <laughs> all right. You look all very bored. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but it might just be me. For, for me, it's now 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 or something like that. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, if you have any follow-up or whatever, feel free to just um, get in touch with either me or George afterwards. Thank you.